At approximately 9.15 a.m. on May 23, 1934, six men waited as a vehicle slowed to approach a fellow driver parked on the shoulder of Louisiana State Highway 154 south of Gibsland. Suicide Sal, as newspapers dubbed her, was heard to scream as her lover was shot fatally in the head by one of the officers concealed in the bushes. Suddenly, all six officers fired 130 rounds into the stolen Ford V8. That came to an eerie stop about 50 yards from the posse. After officers emptied the last round into the getaway car, the group approached. The officers inspected the vehicle and discovered an arsenal of weapons, including stolen automatic rifles, sawed-off semi-automatic shotguns, assorted handguns, several thousand rounds of ammunition, and 15 sets of license plates from various states. Two weeks before suicide Sal would write to her mother, penning her fate. Writing. And someday, they'll go down together. They'll bury them side by side. To few, it'll be grief. To the law a relief. But it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. Today on Wicked Duel. We're looking into the life and crimes of Bonnie Elizabeth Parker. Bonnie Parker was a petite girl, only 4 feet 11 and weighing 90 pounds. With her strawberry blonde curls, Bonnie was described as very pretty, born on October 1, 1910, in Rowena, Texas. She had an older brother, Buster, and a younger sister, Billy. She was the second of three children to Henry and Emma Parker. The family lived comfortably off her father's job as a bricklayer. Still, when he died unexpectedly in 1914, Emma moved the family in with her mother in Cement City, Texas, now part of Dallas. She did well in school and loved writing poetry. In her second year in high school, Parker met Roy Thornton. The couple dropped out of school and married on September 25, 1926, six days before her 16th birthday. Their marriage was marred by his frequent absences and brushes with the law, which proved to be short-lived. They never divorced, but their paths never crossed again after January 1929. Parker was still wearing Thornton's wedding ring when she died. Thornton was in prison when he heard of her death, commenting, I'm glad they jumped out like they did. It's much better than being caught. Separating from her husband, Parker moved back in with her mother and worked as a waitress in Dallas. One of her regular customers was postal worker Ted Hinton. In 1932, he joined the Dallas County Sheriff's Department and eventually served as a posse member that killed Bonnie and Clyde. Parker briefly kept a diary early in 1929 when she was 18, writing of her loneliness, her impatience with life in Dallas, and her love of photography. Several accounts describe Parker and Barrow's first meeting. The most credible states that they met on January 5, 1930, at the home of Barrow's friend, Clarence Clay, at 105 Herbert Street in West Dallas. Barrow was 20 years old, and Parker was 19. Parker was out of work and staying with a female friend to assist her recovery from a broken arm. Barrow dropped by the girl's house while Parker made hot chocolate in the kitchen. Both were smitten immediately, most historians believe that Parker joined Barrow because she had fallen in love with him. Clyde Chestnut Barrow was an attractive man with thick brown hair and around five of or. She remained his loyal companion as they committed their many crimes and awaited the violent death they viewed as inevitable. But before we go further into the life of Bonnie Parker, let's look briefly into the life of her fated lover Clyde Chestnut Barrow. Born in 1909 to a poor farming family in Ellis County, Texas, southeast of Dallas, he was the fifth of seven children of Henry Basil Barrow and Cumi Talita Walker. The family moved to Dallas in the early 1920s as part of a broader migration pattern from rural areas to the city, where many settled in the urban slum of West Dallas. The Barrows spent their first months in West Dallas living under their wagon until they got enough money to buy a tent. Barrow's first arrest was in 1926, at age 17, after running when police confronted him over a rental car that he had failed to return on time. His second arrest was with his brother Buck for possession of stolen turkeys. Barrow had some legitimate jobs from 1927 through 1929, but he also cracked safes, robbed stores, and stole cars. He met 19-year-old Parker through a mutual friend in January 1930, and they spent much time together during the following weeks. Their romance was interrupted when Barrow was arrested and convicted of auto theft. Barrow was sent to East Ham Prison Farm in April 1930 at 21. He escaped from the prison farm shortly after incarceration using a weapon Parker smuggled to him. He was recaptured soon after and sent back to prison. Barrow was repeatedly assaulted while in prison, retaliating by attacking and killing his tormentor with a pipe. 
This was his first murder. Another inmate who was already serving a life sentence claimed responsibility. To avoid hard labor in the fields, Barrow purposely had two of his toes chopped off in late January 1932 by another inmate or himself. Because of this, he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. However, Barrow was set free six days after his intentional injury. Without his knowledge, Barrow's mother had successfully petitioned for his release. He was paroled from East Ham on February 2, 1932, now a hardened and bitter criminal. His sister, Marie, said, something awful sure must have happened to him in prison because he wasn't the same person when he got out. Fellow inmate Ralph Foltz said that he watched Clyde change from a schoolboy to a rattlesnake. 